Hi guys, so today we're going to talk about this disease called Lawsonia intracellularis. What is this disease? I, there is a few points that I need to make. No, number one, it affects young animals. So from weaning all the way to maybe 9, 10, 11, like year of age, okay? That's the time that this particular bacteria affects horses. So it's mainly foals, okay? So that's number one. Number two, Lawsonia intracellularis is a newish disease. It started being described in the 1990s and it is better described in swine, so pigs. Um, we, no one knows how horses actually get it, okay? So we don't know what the reservoir is in nature for horse, if it's deer. Uh, we know pigs have it, we know rabbits have it, but a lot of these horses haven't had any contact with these animals and they have it. So this is one of the things that we need to know. The other thing too, is that it is an intracellular, does the name, Lawsonia intracellularis. It's an intracellular bacteria. So it invades uh, the cells of the um, uh, epithelial wall of the GI tract. And it causes this thing that's called proliferative enteropathy. So proliferative meaning it proliferates, okay? So the cells, you guys remember from biology that cells they divide as in mitosis and then they die, right? So they get renewed all the time um, with new cells. In the case of this disease, when this bacteria infects the cells, these cells continue to multiply and they actually don't die off. They just proliferate, pro proliferate. And it looks like it gives the GI tract, the uh, small intestine, like a cauliflower kind of appears because of all these cells that are multiplying. So there, those are things that you need to understand. Young horses, um, we don't know who the reservoir is. Number three, it causes proliferate, proliferative enteropathy, okay? And it is more well described in swine than it is in horses. We don't really know much about this disease yet, okay? But it's a disease that um, has becoming more and more common. So we need to uh, study it. So like I said, it's an obligate intracellular bacteria. It was first described in the mid 1990s. So it's semi new, uh, produces proliferative enteropathy. In the next slide, it's going to be SPE, okay? It is worldwide distribution. It causes disease in many species. The source of infection in foals has not been identified yet. Um, Transspecies transmission has been shown in laboratory, uh, but we don't know how that happens in nature, okay? So what is the pathogenesis of the disease? Obviously, the severity of the disease, we just talked about this when we talked about salmonella, depends on the load of bacteria ingested by the horse and the immune status of the horse. The pathogenesis is not described in the horses just yet, meaning how the disease goes from the horse ingesting the bacteria to the disease happening. Uh, we know that the disease are going to, the bacteria are going to invade the dividing intestinal cells, and these cells continue to divide even if they are heavily infected. So this is the difference between, for example, rotavirus or salmonella, when the bacteria or, or the virus infects the intestinal cells, these cells are actually gonna die. And as they die, these villi get blunted, and that's how the GI content can get in um, contact with the blood circulation, for example. In this particular disease, these infected cells continue to divide. The problem is they continue to divide, but they are not acting as normal GI epithelial cells. And those cells, what do those cells do? They actually absorb nutrients. So these cells, although they exist, they are not dead they are not acting norm, like normal epithelial cells. So these horses are eating whatever it is that they're eating, but the nutrients are not getting absorbed. And as you guys remember, the uh, function of the GI tract is digestion and absorption of nutrients. So in this particular case, the cells are not dead, the nutrients are not being absorbed, okay? So proliferative, proliferative enteropathy is going to progress, okay? And more proliferation as the disease goes on. Um, and we are going to, which I just said here, reduce intestinal digestive and absorptive capabilities. We're going to have horses that have diarrhea. It can be more severe diarrhea or just pasty. 
uh, feces and definitely weight loss. The age, like I said, goes from weanling to about a year of age. The clinical signs are going to be depression, fever, anorexia, weight loss, diarrhea, colic. So anything really, these horses are not thriving. Okay, these horses are unthrifty and uh, uh, it's just a horse that should not look as bad as they do. They're young, they should be growing, but they're not. So we're going to have poor body condition. Uh, they're going to have a rough hair coat. Uh, sometimes they're going to have pot belly because, and this is one of, not sometimes, a lot of the times, uh, actually uh, edema of the legs, of the abdomen, of the head, anything that, you know, the, the gravity just brings it down is going to happen because the blood is going to lose a lot of the protein. And uh, when the blood doesn't have the colloidal um, capabilities to keep the protein inside and the liquids inside the vasculature, these liquids just go to the extremities. And that's one of the clinical signs of these horses is going to be edema of the legs, edema of the face, and edema of the belly. So we're gonna see here in a second uh, a few photos. The pathological findings. What is pathological findings? Pathological findings is what you see when the horse is actually dead, okay? When those specimens have been sent to pathology to be studied and to be identified. What we are going to see is emaciation. So what does that mean? There is no fat deposits in the subcutaneous tissue of these horses. So they are emaciated. They're very thin because, like I said, they don't absorb the nutrients. We're also going to have subcutaneous edema, so their skin is going to be thickened. Uh, there's going to be thickening of the intestinal mucosa, where we are going to see here soon. Uh, and the lesions are going to be generally in the duodenum and ileum. We're going to have muscular hypertrophy of the intestinal wall. I'm going to show you here a photo soon. And we're going to have hyperplasia. If you guys remember this word, hyperplasia, an increase in the number of cells of the epithelium of the GI tract, okay? So here's the photo. As you can see, if you guys remember from uh, Dr. Warman's class, uh, when you guys did GI tracts of maybe not horses, but of other animals, you remember how thin the mucosa, how thin the wall of the GI tract is. And you guys can differentiate between this. Look at this, how thick this wall actually is, okay? And the lumen is so small. Uh, you can see how edematous, how uh, thick and enlarged and inflamed this uh, intestinal loop actually looks. And as you cut them open, okay, you can see how inflamed and red and how proliferative, how it looks like a cauliflower everywhere. And if you guys remember from Dr. Warman's class, uh, the GI tract is not supposed to look like this. So the duodenum, the, du the, the duodenum, uh, and the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum are going to have different surfaces, but none of them are going to look as bad as this. And this is another specimen here. It's not as red as the one, but you can see how very thickened and how it, it seems to have more cells than it should be. Uh, so this, remember I said, this is a horse that is unthrifty. This particular foe here doesn't have a lot of edema going on, but he is just skinny, doesn't look good, um, and as, so how do you diagnose this disease? We're going to do ultrasound, we're going to do PCR of the feces of this foal, but upon ultrasound, you're going to see how thick the intestinal loops actually are. So this is the lumen of the intestine, and these are the loops, the wall of the intestines are going to be thickened. And here again, very thick mucosa and muscular areas of the intestinal wall. So what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is going to be other common GI diseases, such as anything that can affect the horse, uh, salmonella, rhodococcus, which uh, rhodococcus is going to cause pneumonia in these foals, but they're going to be sick and unthrifty, clostridium, uh, any kind of intestines, parasites, uh, intestinal obstruction parasites, potomac horse fever. Potomac horse fever it's generally more uh, acute and very severe diarrhea, uh, but some cases can be actually more chronic and the horse is just unthrifty. The clinical signs, uh, we're going to have to figure out, you know, 
other types of clinical signs, such like I said, the, the thickening of the intestinal wall, which uh, is going to be observed via ultrasound. You're going to do serology. Serology, you're going to see maybe uh, antibodies for the disease, uh, but definitely you're going to see that there is low protein uh, in the blood of the horse. I uh, already talked about this guy here. How do we treat this disease? Um, there is, so treatment for this particular disease is a few antibiotics. There's different ones that we can use. So erythromycin and uh, clarithromycin is also used. If you guys remember this, erythromycin and clarithromycin, okay? So these are macrolides. Do you guys remember macrolides? So macrolides, if you guys remember, are toxic to adult horses. They cause a severe diarrhea. But the macrolides actually go all the way inside because the way to kill this particular bacteria, the antibiotics have to enter the cell as these bacteria are obligate intracellular. So not every antibiotic actually goes all the way inside the cell to kill the bacteria. In this case, erythromycin and clarithromycin actually do, and if you guys remember, it's very toxic to adult horses, killing them, and our luck is that the best antibiotics to treat this bacteria are actually okay to treat the animals because these are false, okay? So you just need to remember that, but it's a long-ish treatment. It's going to be three times a day, uh, giving antibiotics, sometimes three weeks, sometimes longer, uh, you can also use uh, LA200, which is oxytetracycline, or doxycycline, metronidazole can also be used, uh, chloramphenicol can also be used, so it's just whatever the horse is responding uh, better as Sometimes you can make this horse uh, turn around, and sometimes it just can't, and the horse should be euthanized in the end. Uh, other more common antibiotics do not treat the disease, okay? You're going to give omeprazole uh, to try to prevent uh, gastric ulcer, obviously. Fluids, if these horses are so unthrifty and they have a lot of edema, you have to give uh, plasma to these horses of a normal horse or uh, a hypercolloidal type of uh, fluid to try to draw liquid inside the vasculature again, to try to remove the edema from the legs of these horses and from uh, the extremities of these horses. So you have to do that to try to prevent because low protein inside the vasculature is a problem. So here you guys can see edema of his little neck. And here you can see very edematous uh, abdomen. The prepuce of this horse is very edematous. Um, and like I said, it's the edema of the areas that mainly hang down. So the legs, the abdomen, prepuce, head, etc. Okay. This is a little horse. He's a little Arab, uh, Arab cross or whatnot. And you can see him here at, I don't know, eight months of age, very unthrifty, uh, rough hair coat, edema in the head, uh, very unthrifty, like this horse is malnourished. And then after treatment, some horses do make full recovery and can go on with their lives. Um, at the University of Kentucky, we have research devoted exclusively to the Lawson Intracellularis at the Gluck Equine Center. And they, in combination with the local hospitals, have done a lot of research and have uh, put their hands in a lot of um, specimens uh, because it has been a problem in the last you know, 10 years um, and just getting worse and worse. So I'm hoping that they're about to figure out exactly what the um, the reservoir is so we can actually be able to prevent because as of right now there is no way to prevent this disease your horse your foe either has it or doesn't have it because the epidemiology is not well understood there is absolutely no way to prevent this disease one of the ways that we think isolate the infected foes so they are not around other normal foes infecting other foes possibly uh, but that's the only thing that we actually know. As of right now, Lawsonia intracellularis is not considered a zoonotic disease, but this disease has been described in primates. So we don't know if uh, it can actually pass to people or not. As of right now, we don't think it can, but it may be possible 
later on. Uh, discard. So if you have, if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. But this is uh, about Lausonia intracellularis, which causes proliferative enteropathy in young horses.